I'm the Talking Skull, and this year I'm exploring classic first-person shooters to draw a line from Wolfenstein 3D to Halo. This week, we see the dramatic fall from grace of one of gaming's beloved icons. Ah, <sighs> Daikatana. There was a lot of reason to be excited about this game, at first. John Romero had been a driving force behind Doom, and his contributions to Quake remained some of the best. Romero was clearly a fantastic level designer and knew what he wanted out of a game. But level design was not his only responsibility anymore, and Romero had already proven his failings as a project manager when id ousted him for failing to make any use of Quake's long engine development time. Eid had succeeded with Quake almost in spite of Romero, and Ion Storm would run over the same bumps in the road, leaving many a black mark on its legendarily ill-fated road to release. Romero founded Ion Storm with the promise of a utopian studio where design is law, courting an unhealthy fortune from Eidos to build this golden-crusted fantasy land. Starry-eyed developers flocked to rub elbows with the king himself, turning his every whim into their own blood, sweat, and hopefully video game stages. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't get over this quote. I don't care if it's not possible, you'll do it anyway! Where Romero had promised a budding developer's dream, his employees found a waking nightmare. Romero, undeterred by his failure to manage his dozen-person Quake team, ballooned Ion Storm's crew to 80 strong. Conflicts started immediately. Ion Storm founders bickered and argued constantly, dropping two of their six co-owners only a year into development. The stakes for Ion Storm were high, the tensions were higher, and nobody in the world was higher than John Romero when he dreamed up his prospective release dates. Dates that would be pushed back countless times, from his initial promise of Christmas 1997 to its actual release date two and a half years later. First, it was because, despite his insistence that technology would be subservient to design, Romero couldn't help but ogle the newest fancy tech from his former partner, scrapping a year of work to start over in 98 using the Quake 2 engine. But mostly, Ion Storm were falling apart internally, while Romero blindly guessed at wildly optimistic release dates. As Ion Storm missed deadline after deadline, working conditions turned downright hostile. Leaked internal emails reveal a team that was blowing through money way too fast, blaming each other for it and clawing at each other's throats at every turn. A damning Dallas Observer expose revealed just how bad things were at Ion Storm, uncovering dirty laundry from all of the company's leadership and painting the picture of growing discontent among the team. Feel free to pause and read that. A coordinated walkout immortalized as the Ion 8 drew attention from the industry, but over Daikatana's three-year development, nearly the entire team was replaced. And while all this drama was happening inside Ion Storm, the atmosphere outside was no better. Romero had been a god to the FPS fandom, but years of poor PR and misguided marketing with no game to show for it left fans bitter and angry. Oh, but Romero does regret that infamous ad now. Okay, first of all, I've never called anyone my bitch in my whole life, and I never will because that is gay. <laughs> Oof. By year three, fans had enough, and expectations for the game bottomed out. Romero was dead to his groupies. When the dust settled and gamers got to play the long-promised Daikatana, no one walked away happy. The game was a financial black hole, spending tens of millions of dollars, but walking away with only 40,000 copies sold in the first six months. That's less than Rise of the Triad. So, how is the actual game? Well... It's hard to talk about Daikatana. 
In a lot of ways, Daikatana is actually four separate games, stitched together with a less than passable plot. Every single episode starts from scratch with brand new environments, enemies, and weapons. This is a neat concept, but it means there's no through line here. Anything that works in one episode disappears by the next. This kind of novelty deluge can work, but it requires each individual episode to be polished to a mirror shine, or for each section to end before it overstays its welcome. Daikatana does neither. The first episode comes in slow and sloppy, with buggy looking visual effects and broken audio. This team badly needed a professional writer. They clearly aspired to tell some kind of epic tale, but it all plays out in cutscenes. No scripted events, unfocused environmental storytelling, and awful dialogue. Oh god, I think I know what that shield was warning us about. What? We have to get out of here. Why? This opening spends eight minutes burying you under a mountain of exposition, most of which doesn't even wind up mattering. The virus? No. Most dishearteningly, the encounter design falls on its face at every turn. These turrets can't be destroyed. You're supposed to blow up their fuse box, but that mechanic isn't properly introduced until like an hour later. And fighting off these swarms could be cool, but your only attack is this precision skill shot that can't even kill these bugs in one hit. Mowing through hordes with a chain gun or blasting them with a shotgun could have been great fun, but instead you're forced to slowly plink away and it could not be less engaging. Then you get these sticky mines that magnetically snap to any nearby corner and kill you. This is your first impression of Daikatana. Finicky, obnoxious, frustrating, tedious. Episodes 2 through 4 aren't like this. Remember, they're basically different games. But Daikatana puts its worst foot forward with this mess. Combat in later episodes gets punchier and far less punishing, often to the opposite extreme. Episode 2's difficulty crashes straight through the floor, to the point that I never even bothered saving because I didn't need to. Oh yeah, I have to mention the Resident Evil ink ribbons. A lot of people complain about these, but they're honestly fine. It's a clumsy attempt to prevent save scumming, and it works. The game auto-saves plenty often, it barely needed manual saves anyway. People are babies. You could remove save crystals from episode 2 entirely. It's not like these glue eaters can kill you. But while the combat difficulty plummets, the navigational difficulty skyrockets. Starting around the middle of the game, Daikatana gets too ambitious with hidden keys and level-spanning puzzles, taking more than a few pages from Hexen's book. If you've seen my Marathon Infinity or Jedi Knight videos, this may all sound familiar to you. Non-local locks mean the player can miss a hidden key and not even realize it until the end of the stage, at which point they have to scour the whole map for whatever nugget they missed. Similarly, levels loop back around to their starting point without clearly indicating why they've looped and what you're looking for. This gets even worse when the level didn't even need to loop around, specifically leading the player the wrong way and opening up the entire map to meticulous searching, when what the player needed was right there in the last room. But it all comes down to clear objectives. Players need to know what they're looking for and how to look for it. Otherwise, we may as well be 100% completing Wolfenstein. But when you're jumping for that awkwardly placed ledge, hoping against hope that it leads to progress, be careful. Instant death pits litter Daikatana's stages. Even worse, this game inexplicably has extreme sonic physics. Any slope at all will carry 1000% of your momentum, rocketing you off into parts unknown. <laughs> I feel like people who've played Daikatana will be waiting to hear me rant about the companion system, and... <sighs> yeah, it's... terrible. The thing is, this companion system is cool, and it's a natural evolution of the growing trend toward more dynamic, friendly AI. 
Who doesn't want to fight side by side with a buddy? And commanding them to stay, follow, or grab health allows you enough control over their behavior that they shouldn't be a liability. So why doesn't it work? The most obvious answer is that Daikatana fails your mission if an ally dies. Half-Life's guards aren't story critical, so the game can continue if they tragically explode. The game feels dynamic, you feel guilty, it's great. But now that these allies have to survive, they can become a nuisance. Except that's not actually that big of a problem. Sure, Superfly will sometimes randomly charge into a dozen rockets, but those moments are rare. If he's looking hurt, you can always tell him to hang back or grab some health. Your allies shouldn't be dying that often. But there's another larger issue with companions. Padding. The AI simply cannot navigate these stages, and its follow behavior is idiotic. But the game blocks you from exiting the mission unless you've got everyone in tow. I can't How you holding up, Nico? Doing pretty good. So if they get stuck working on their cardio somewhere, you have to reload and try to manhandle them into going the right way. Ladders in particular seem beyond their comprehension. You're constantly looking over your shoulder to check and see, yep, sure enough, Akiko's not following anymore. Better backtrack until I find her and push her off whatever rock she took an unhealthy interest in. Oh, and those instant death pits? It's bad enough when I fall in them, but what the hell am I supposed to do about this? And the AI problems don't stop with your friends. These already unfun goons constantly lose track of where you are or what they're doing, despite much simpler behavior than games from years earlier. It had set the original standard for FPS monster design. It's shocking to see John Romero put out a game like this. With enemies this slow, stupid, and boring, the combat never has a chance to be fun, even when you're using the best weapon in the game. Which, by the way, is not the Daikatana. Perhaps the most damning thing about Daikatana is that its namesake sucks. All its moves are slow and delayed, the hit registration perplexes me, and you can't even control what swing you use. They're just picked at random. This feels like garbage. It's not even powerful unless you level it up, so as soon as you get a ranged weapon, it becomes obsolete. So how long do you play with it before that happens? See for yourself. That's right, you get another better weapon before you've even had a chance to use the Daikatana. Ugh, there's too much to get into. A full analysis of Daikatana's many failings and oddities would take an hour-long dissertation. The saddest part for me is that it bears so little resemblance to John Romero's other work. Romero excelled at level and encounter design, at satisfying guns and monsters, but so much of Daikatana was delegated to the massive team that Romero's personal touch seems to have been limited to the broadest ideas and the exact poor project management that got him fired from id. Despite all that, Romero is still rightly remembered as one of the best and most influential game developers of all time. Meanwhile, his own company would ironically become better known for its other studio, far removed from Romero's mess. If you're as stupid as I am and want to try Daikatana yourself, Fanpatch 1.3 addresses many of the game's most criticized elements. I don't love the companion health buff, but for the improved pathing alone, you'll want this patch. Just don't expect it to salvage the game. There simply isn't a strong core to Daikatana, so no fan patch could ever turn it into a good game. Or if you want to experience true suffering, play the N64 port. But don't blame Ion Storm for that version's, uh, particular quirks. If this old stuff is interesting to you, check out the rest of my series on classic first-person shooters to see what I had to say about Quake and more. Next week, the N64 has its last hurrah.